Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mercedes Witowski. I am the executive director at the New Jersey Council on Developmental Disabilities, and I would like to welcome you to the first 2022 session of the New Jersey Legislative Disability Caucus. I'd like to thank the legislative leaders um, and their staff of the caucus for joining us today. Um, we're really fortunate to have um, your support and delighted that 33 members of the legislature serve on the New Jersey Developmental Dis New Jersey Disability Caucus. Um, we will miss the staunch leadership of our past chair, Senator C Steve Sweeney, and other legislative members of the caucus who will not be with us this year, but please join me in welcoming new members of the legislature. Some have joined the caucus already, and we invite others to reach out um, to join the caucus after today's session. When the caucus launched in was December of 2020, New Jersey became one of eight other states across the country who have some form of a legislative disability caucus. Uh, legislative leaders and their staff have joined as panelists today, and we um, are pleased to see so many of attendees also joining us today. Uh, attendees are in listen-only mode. We are recording today's session, so if you can remain on mute, that will assist us in getting the best recording possible. And um, we do hope to hear from you though, even if you're in attendee mode, uh, attendees uh, can use the link that should be in the chat for um, the caucus webpage. Um, and there you can communicate with the caucus. I did see something about not getting audio. So can we just confirm that somebody else just nod that they can hear me? That'd be great. Okay, great. Thumbs are up. Um, so we know that there's many issues on the minds of one in four New Jerseyans who identify as having a disability and the families that they either live with or that support them. So today we're delighted to take a look back at the success of the first year of the caucus when we covered the impact of COVID-19, employment, housing, and transportation within the disability community. Legislators had the opportunity to review these issues facing their constituents and share bills that they proposed to meet the needs of the disability community. But from my perspective, there were two other very important takeaways from 2021. The first takeaway is that these sessions were structured to have legislative discussion but to also hear directly from individuals with disabilities, to hear directly from family members and the organizations supporting individuals with disabilities. So it's important that we've heard firsthand from those impacted by the system because we have much to do to bring um, about changes that are needed. And then the second thing that we learned is that we learned that we can't think about disabilities in a vacuum, right? We, we have to make sure that disability discussions are woven into all that work that we do. Um, otherwise, there can be unintended consequences. So, and, you know, we remember one in four people identify with a disability. So chances are everything, everything done in the legislature will impact people with disabilities or their families. So we're gonna keep disabilities front and center in our work in all that we do. Um, and now I'm gonna invite you to sit back for a minute. We have a, a short video um, that we'd like to share with you now that will help recap the first year of the caucus. The New Jersey Legislative Disability Caucus launched on December 1st, 2020. And in 2021, they held four roundtable discussions to examine critical issues facing the disability community. The Disability Caucus serves as a bipartisan forum within the New Jersey Legislature for lawmakers and their staff to consider the impact on the disability community when shaping all public policies through increased awareness and a greater understanding of the complexities within the disability service system and issues affecting these individuals and their families. People with disabilities, their families and organizations serve as resources to the caucus, providing education and programming as needed. 
with approximately 25% of adults in New Jersey identifying as having some type of disability, the caucus ensures their voice is heard in all decision-making processes. This is critically important as people with disabilities in New Jersey continue to seek opportunities to be included and represented in all aspects of life as an integral part of the fabric of our society. New Jersey is among just a handful of states that have formed a disability caucus within its state legislature. And in our inaugural year, New Jersey had 37 legislatures that joined to support and listen from these supporting agencies. These agencies provided disability advocates to speak on the issues at the roundtables that were held in 2021. Since the official launch of the Disability Caucus in December of 2020, the organization hit the ground running in 2021 with meetings starting in January through October. The topics covered issues like the impact of COVID, employment concerns, issues regarding housing and transportation. To learn more, please follow our YouTube channel and or to view the full discussions. Before we begin our program, we wanted to show you some of the highlights from those discussions, starting with the official launch of the New Jersey Legislative Disability Caucus on December 1st, 2020. Legislation that is going to have an impact on everyone in the state. We have to make sure that people with disabilities that their views are put into the mix also. So having this caucus together, and I said this before, I'm, I'm grateful that Tom Kane and I worked on many issues in the Senate, and the legislators on this call, I know all have a, have a great level of care and compassion. And and uh, this is something we should have done a long time ago. I'm glad we're, we're finally here, that we're gonna ensure that people with disabilities voices are heard as we just recently did with NJ Transit. Uh, the impact on healthcare and the disparity of uh, residents with disabilities and how it might affect their healthcare, see them with a higher level of health costs and needs that may go unhidden or unnoticed until the time of the West. We talk about equality. We talk about pandemic. We talk about health. We talked about social justice. We talked about vaccine importance. So as we move forward with this caucus, we cannot forget our folks who are there to contribute the same things that we are searching for, and that is equality. They need to be put on the same playing field that we are. They have families to support. They want to live independently. They don't take handouts, and they want to make sure that they are an equal partner in everything we do in the legislature. One who grew up family with a family member with a de developmental disability. Uh, I understand firsthand how hard it is, uh, not only for uh, the disabled, but for the family members uh, and how they struggle to make sure that their voice is heard and how they worry what the future will bring uh, for their loved ones. As we know, tearing down barriers and creating accommodations is not about uh, something that's nice to have. This is about making sure that we honor the civil rights of all of New Jersey's residents with disabilities. Uh, the issue of mental health is always important. Uh, we've spoken about it. I've struggled with depression for years. It's really important an issue to me. And that is something I know that so many women have and many others have championed uh, the Senate president that we need to make sure that those with disabilities, the mental health challenges that they face that collectively, it's not on the back burner. And I know that uh, with this caucus in the months and years ahead, there are going to be so many issues that we can make sure that those who are the most vulnerable here in New Jersey are not left behind. I think about early intervention and the importance of it. It's not only important for able children, it's so, so important for the disabled child. So to determine early on whether or not, you know, the diagnosis of autism or ADHD or severe learning disability, comprehension disability. There's so many educational components. The earliest the intervention can happen, the better the result can, can be for children. Um, education, education is you know equity. You know all students is imperative. We need to remove barriers. Uh, I think I've heard this several times, but we do. We need to remove the barriers so that uh, so that our children uh, can be successful. It is really the mission of this caucus that everything we do, whether or not it's transportation, whether or not it's education, whether or not it's 
it's human services or whether or not it's you know finance insurance and banking we're constantly thinking constantly thinking about our disabled community every person with a disability is unique and their needs are unique and we have to remember that it's not one size fits all this especially became clear during covid all of the issues the one talked about whether it be transportation education food housing all of those different issues health care but we is not again limited to one group because we have intellectual disabilities we have developmental disabilities we have physical disabilities we have multi disabilities people who suffer from dual diagnosis so they have mental health issues to care with another disability those who have multi many three or four that's again why it's so hard to really have one size fits all and with that we need to re remember to include the parents to include the caregivers the guardians because they know best too as well as the rest of these wonderful people these organizations on january 26 of 2021 the disability caucus chair senate president steve sweeney the legislative caucus members and advocates from the disability community met for the inaugural meeting of the caucus to discuss the impact of COVID-19 on people with disabilities. With the COVID-19 pandemic taking a disproportionate toll on people with disabilities, the topic led to a robust discussion among policymakers and advocates for this first briefing session of 2021. The impact on healthcare and the disparity of uh, residents with disabilities and how it might affect their healthcare, see them with a higher level of health costs and needs that maybe go unhidden or unnoticed until the time of the budget. Despite all of the work that has been done, I mean, COVID-19 has showed us how much more work is left to do. And together, we have to continue to work with all of you. Um, we've heard about many of the services and issues that are needed for everyone today, but there's no question that one of the most pressing issues facing the disability community is access to mental health services. And COVID-19, as you heard, and as we all know, has taken a toll on everyone's mental health. However, access for the disability community can look very different and pose many different obstacles than what the non-disabled community experiences. COVID-19 has left all of us feeling isolated, lonely. However, for individuals with disabilities living in group homes, that isolation has been all the more extreme. On April 27th of 2021, the Legislative Disability Caucus convened to discuss employment issues relating to barriers, successes, and future directions. And as we start talking about employment and we start talking about the value of having folks with disabilities work with us, and actually contribute to the way we see things is such a pleasure. On July 27th of 2021, the Legislative Disability Caucus met to discuss issues relating to housing. You pointed out S-1676 has now been signed by uh, Governor Murphy. It is the law of our state. And uh, what it does is to allow hospitals per permissibly, they're not mandated, but they are permitted, to get into the housing business, the housing healthcare business. As was pointed out in Mercedes' opening remarks, uh, housing uh, for the disability, disabled community, for the uh, homeless community has huge impacts on healthcare outcomes. It also applies for the disabled community. Uh, the, the, you know, this, especially as you said, the, the, the goal is to get 100 uh, deed restricted Medicaid uh, beds. Let's get thousands, forget hundreds. Let's go for the gold. Um, if there's one thing that we know, it's that the demand has and still does far exceed uh, the supply for some group homes, especially here in my district in Morris County, where the housing stock is so expensive. Uh, we can certainly do better around the state. I wanna commend um, my colleague and next speaker Senator Singleton for his recent legislation that would free up to $20 million for special needs health for the special needs housing trust fund um, in the housing and mortgage finance agency, increasing funding for these projects um, to design the house and help individuals with special needs is, is essential for accomplishing the goals uh, that we share.
just last week I had uh, the, the good fortune to sit down and meet with Mars County Housing Alliance. And the demographics show that in Mars County, nearly 50% of our homeless population uh, suffer from some form of disability or mental health issue. Uh, so, you know, we need to be able to fund these projects and we need to make them uh, affordable. Since joining the legislature, you know, it's been part of my mission to really think through and try and work to secure uh, an access for housing for every resident. And it becomes especially important for our, our residents who deal with disabilities due to the special needs housing. Um, the focus of this new law, quite frankly, is to buttress the special needs housing trust fund. Now, this trust fund was established in 2006 by the New Jersey Economic Development Authority. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we, come to, we came to realize that the fund has since been depleted, uh, despite its critical role in supporting housing projects for some of our state's most vulnerable populations. Uh, when learning about the depletion of the funding, it became critical for legislative intervention to find a source of funding uh, for this important initiative. And I'm proud that this law was passed unanimously by all members uh, who voted in the Senate and the General Assembly. Uh, this new bipartisan law was stated transfers $20 million from the Affordable Housing Trust Fund to the Special Needs Housing Trust Fund. On October 26 of 2021, the issues relating to transportation were discussed at the caucus roundtable. Just last week, I met with an organization and there were over 100 people on that call um, just sharing appalling stories of what they personally experienced. Um, and really, it, it, what it comes down to uh, is one word and it's stranded. People have been stranded. Transportation access is key too. We, I'm proud uh, at Transportation to work with my colleagues and to join this caucus so that we have um, a, a fight for transportation equity. We know that disability doesn't take a day off. Disability doesn't take a holiday. So transportation equity and equity in all that we do is so important day in and day out in our policies. It has to be baked in. In this first year, we've actually accomplished a few things I think that are meaningful. Uh, by no means are we finished. We have a long way to go, but uh, this caucus, I am thrilled with the bipartisan nature of my colleagues that are on this, that we put the, you know, the disabled community first, and we're just figuring out how we can do things better. Because one thing we did know is don't work. System does not work. To learn more about the New Jersey Legislative Disability Caucus, please visit our website. So as we watched um, and that video, and as I was looking at the, the five recorded sessions um, over last year, I, I could see how we made a difference um, and that um, there was some historical moments in our year. Um, the, the bills that were introduced, uh, the discussed and voted on and then signed by the governor, um, were remarkable. And, you know, when we heard in our first session about students who were struggling with learning loss and um, when schools were closed during COVID, we then watched the legislature support and um, the community advocate for Senate Bill 3434 and its companion Bill 5366, which provides special education and related services to certain students beyond age 21. When we listened um, in the employment session about the age and financial limitations impacting Medicaid benefits within the New Jersey Workability Program. The legislature again took action and Senate Bill 3455 with its companion 5262 had a full support of the legislature to revise eligibility requirements in the Workability Program and the Personal Assistance Service Program. In housing, um, we were able to kick off the housing session with incredible news from Senator Singleton and Senator Smith. Um, and to know now that the $20 million will be there um, to support the Special Needs Housing Trust Fund and create affordable um, and supportive housing for individuals with disabilities um, is key. In transportation, 
We also um, know that the, the governor signed bills supporting the quality of our paratransit system and for all those for all those who rely on paratransit. So these bills and a, a long list of other bills made their way through the Senate, through the assembly last year. And again, were signed by our governor showing the demo and demonstrating commitment and support. And I hope, and I think that the caucus really helped um, focus our attention and our, and our efforts. Um, so let's remember, you know, when I think about this, we are in this together and we can make changes and have impact together. So for the remainder of this session today, we wanna to spotlight 15 of the 50 and ever-growing supporting agencies to the caucus. The work of these organizations is critical because like I said, we're in this together. We hope that members of the legislature look to these organizations as you meet with constituents who need your help in your districts. Um, we're here to support each other. You know, we couldn't invite 50 organizations to speak today, um, but so you know, we are working on a directory of all current 50 supporting organizations and as many others that want to join in this effort. Um, we'll be able to get you out that directory, which will give you contact information and a brief description of the organizations. Um, those agencies I know are eager to hear from you and um, help is on the way. So to start off, I'm going to um, invite Paul Aronson to unmute um, and turn on his video. And then each of the speakers that follow Paul, they have a list, they will come on um, following each other and just give you a quick snapshot of what they do. Paul, thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Paul Aronson. I have to say I'm New Jersey's ombudsman for individuals with intellectual or developmental disabilities and their families. Uh, as you all probably know, it's a relatively new office. It was created by the New Jersey legislature uh, in December of 2017. It was signed into law by Governor Christie in January of 2018, and I was appointed by Governor Murphy in April of 2018. Uh, there's two of us in the office, myself and our deputy director, Christine Bachter, uh, and we work with individuals, children as well as adults and their families across the state uh, on the full range of issues that, that uh, affect the lives of people with intellectual developmental disabilities. Uh, we spend most of our time troubleshooting issues, uh, trying to help people who are trying to navigate the system, uh, trying to find the resources that they need and trying to help connect them with the right people, uh, not just in state government, uh, but throughout, throughout the state and the county of municipal advocacy provider communities uh, across the board. Uh, as many of you know, we work very closely with legislators uh, individually and collectively. And of course, we work with most of the organizations, if not all the organizations represented here today. Um, if anyone needs to reach us, you should know how to reach us. I might put my email in the, in the chat and uh, look forward to another successful year. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Deborah Spitalnik, the Executive Director of the Bog Center on Developmental Disabilities, a community health program of Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical School addressing children and adults with disabilities, their families, those who work on their behalf, and state and community agencies. As New Jersey's federally designated University Center for Excellence under the Developmental Disabilities Act and guided by a Consumer Advisory Council, the Bog Center serves as a bridge between the community and the university by educating the next generation of professionals, including every medical student at Robert Wood Johnson, um, provides community training and technical assistance in partnership with the Division of Developmental Disabilities, the Office of Special Education Programs, the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation Services, and the Division of Medical Assistance and Health Services, NJ Family Care. The center collaborates in the provision of primary health care, conducts research, and provides information about disabilities, most recently emphasizing COVID-19 and vaccine. The Bach Center is also New Jersey's 
Leadership Education in Neurodevelopmental Disabilities, NJ Lend, a clinical interdisciplinary program through the US Maternal and Child Health Bureau in the Health Resources Service Administration and addressing autism and other early onset disabilities, health disparities, public policy, and the social determinants of health federally mandated to serve as a resource to policymakers. The Bog Center is honored to support the efforts of the New Jersey Legislative Disability uh, Caucus and the leadership inherent in the commitment of our legislators. Thank you very much for the opportunity to introduce you to the Bog Center. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for inviting Disability Rights New Jersey to present uh, quickly here today. I'm Gwen Orlowski. I am the Executive Director of Disability Rights New Jersey. Disability Rights New Jersey is the designated protection and advocacy agency in New Jersey under federal law, um, along with our DD partners, the Bog Center and J NJCDD. Uh, every state has a designated protection and advocacy agency. And again, our authority is rooted in federal law. Um, the PNA system developed in the mid 1970s in response to a um, documentary by Geraldo Rivera about a developmental center in New York called Willowbrook. And, uh, and we existed initially in state government in New Jersey in the initial um, iteration of the public advocate. We came out of state government in 1994 and became a nonprofit agency. Um, we exist, as I said, under federal law, and we fill the functions um, that are required under that federal scheme of statutes. Our mission is to support the civil, legal, and human rights of individuals with disabilities, and we do that in a myriad of ways. We have authority to conduct investigations of abuse and neglect in any setting where a person with disability is receiving services. We're somewhat like the long-term care ombudsman that way. We monitor any setting where an individual with a disability is receiving services. We also are a law firm within Disability Rights New Jersey with a cadre of attorneys and advocates, and we represent people in individual um, legal matters related to our priorities, as well as systems changing litigation. Both uh, we can be the plaintiff in lawsuits and we can bring class actions. In addition, we do investigation and referral outreach, training, and education. We also are the client assistance program under the Rehab Act, which means we represent um, clients of the VR agencies who are seeking services. Um, we do that and so much more, and I will put my contact information uh, so that you all can uh, get in touch with us if you'd like. Thank you so much. And for the third, um, federally authorized uh, organization, the New Jersey Council on Developmental Disabilities um, is also authorized under the Federal Developmental Disabilities Act of 2000. There are 56 federally authorized councils across the country and U.S. territories with the purpose to assure that individuals with developmental disabilities and their families, that they, have the, they are able to participate in the design and have access to the needed community services as well as individual supports, other forms of assistance that promote self-determination, independence, productivity, and integration and inclusion in the community. Our purpose is to engage in advocacy, capacity building, and systemic change activities that contribute to a coordinated consumer and family-centered system of supports. And those are the technical words, but to what it boils down to is that our charge at the New Jersey Council is to make sure that people with developmental disabilities and their families have access to what they need, when they need it, and have as much choice and control in how those supports are received and provided so that they can choose the lives that they um, decide in the community. So how do we do this? Um, we work together with stakeholders. We listen to what people um, tell us and we develop a five-year plan from there. Um, we um, focus our attention on advocacy, building capacity, and systemic uh, systems change activities. Um, we then develop an annual work plan 
um, at which point we have internal staff that carry out some of those activities. And we also process applications um, for proposals or requests for proposals so that um, organizations can do some of our work um, and we fund those organizations. And the third way in which um, organizations support us is that we have something called a community innovation project. So if somebody has a really good idea um, and it's something that they can do locally in their community and it may have systems change and a way in which to impact um, and provide replication in other parts of the state, um, then we will fund projects as well um, at the local level. So I encourage folks to look at our website, um, uh, read our five-year plan, look at our grant opportunities, join our family support planning councils um, all, all, all across the state for family members of individuals with disabilities and our people first and youth advocacy chapters also all across the state. Um, thank you very much for letting me explain what the council is all about. Hi, I'm Diana Otin, and I'm the executive director of the SPAN Parent Advocacy Network. We're the federally designated Parent Training and Information Center and Family to Family Health Information Center for New Jersey. Our mission is to empower families and inform and involve professionals interested in the healthy development and education of children and youth to enable them to become fully participating, contributing members of our communities and society. Our foremost commitment is to children with the greatest need due to disability, special health care need, discrimination based on race, gender, ethnicity, gender identity, sexual orientation, language, immigrant status, involvement in the child welfare or juvenile justice system, geographic location, or family or other circumstances. We provide family and professional development or training, individual assistance, information and resources, advocacy and support to New Jersey parents of children ages zero to 26, youth, young adults, and the professionals who serve them, and also to family serving family led organizations around the country, including almost 100 parent centers and 59 family to family health information centers. So how can we be a resource to you and to the Legislative Disability Caucus? Well, first, we get information from tens of thousands of families and professionals who call our warm line on child welfare, disability across all disability areas, early childhood, including childcare, education, health, juvenile justice, mental health, transition to adult life. What's happening on the ground? What's going well? Where are the service gaps or problems with accessing quality services? In addition to being able to share information about what we're hearing from families, youth, and professionals, we also can share promising policies and practices from around the country. What are innovative ways that other states and jurisdictions are addressing the issues that are faced by families of children, youth, and young adults with disabilities? We get this information in part because of our role housing several national projects that provide technical assistance to those other family organizations. But we also, because we house those national education, health and transition technical assistance centers, we get information on new developments from federal agencies like the US Departments of Education, Health and Human Services and Labor. And before closing, I want to um, thank the Council on Developmental Disabilities for their leadership in establishing the, the Legislative Disability Caucus, as well as for funding our special education volunteer advocate program which is now being funded by the New Jersey Department of Education that can provide very intensive support to families of children with disabilities in the IEP process. So I also want to thank Peg Kinsell, who's our policy director, who is on the Council on Developmental Disabilities and who also has been very active in supporting the Legislative Disability Caucus. Thank you very much for this opportunity to share information on SPAN. Good afternoon. My name is Norman Smith. I'm chair of the British State University Council. I'm going to ask my 
Thank you, Norm. Um, that was Norm, the chair of the Statewide Independent Living Council, and I am going to read our statement. The New Jersey Statewide Independent Living Council is a federally mandated council. It is made up of members with disabilities appointed by the governor. Silk plays a lead role in writing the state plan for independent living along with New Jersey's 12 centers for independent living and the division of vocational rehabilitation services. The state plan empowers New Jersey to receive federal funding for consumer directed independent living service. We also host a variety of forums on the issues impacting all people with disabilities throughout New Jersey. Additionally, the SILK coordinates with other disability councils, agencies, and groups to address the needs of people with disabilities throughout the state. The SILK is responsible for submitting periodic reports to the Administration of Community Living, helps to determine the distribution of state funds to the SILKs, and advocates for cross-disability independent living needs. The current state plan covers employment, housing, inclusive communities, and emergency management planning that includes all people with disabilities. We advocate under each of these goals with a cross-disability focus, which means we view issues broadly and our advocacy does not represent one particular group of people. Our support, our support of this caucus is in that very same spirit. We believe that working together with other disability groups organizational leaders and legislators in this caucus, as well as individuals with disabilities and their families, we can empower all New Jerseyans with disabilities to have more independence, autonomy, and access to the resources we need to live our best lives. And we look forward to the work we all can do together in 2022. Thank you. Thank you, Carmen. Hello, great to be with you all. I'm Dr. Suzanne Buchanan, psychologist and executive director of Autism New Jersey. I have two quick messages, one for your constituents and one for you as legislators and staff. For your constituents, Autism New Jersey's 804 Autism Helpline provides information regarding diagnostic services, treatment, family support, service navigation, across the lifespan in both English and Spanish. Our 800 for Autism Helpline is staffed by an attorney, a social worker, and a very seasoned parent who offer families compassion and practical next steps. They have expertise in special education matters, insurance and Medicaid funded treatment, and helping individuals in behavioral crisis. Honestly, anything related to autism will help them find the answers and most likely connect with our sister organizations here on the call today and, and the entire community to get families what they need. And the second message for legislators and staff, Autism New Jersey has a long and productive history of working with public officials, both in the legislature and the administration to advance public policy initiatives for individuals with autism and their families. So if you're considering autism related legislation, please connect with us as a resource and as a sounding board. You can call our 800 for autism line and ask for me, Suzanne Buchanan, or our public policy director, Eric Eberman, Thank you again to the council and caucus members for your time today. And we're very much looking forward to working with you. Good afternoon. I'm Shauna Moses, I'm Vice President of Public Affairs and Member Services with the New Jersey Association of Mental Health and Addiction Agencies. We can say Najama for short, which makes it a lot easier. Uh, although IDD is not fit into our name because we are continuing our branding. Uh, we are 70 years old now. We do represent providers of IDD services as well. And many of them um, have clients who also have co-occurring mental health disorders, substance use disorders, or both. Uh, we have about 160 organizational members that provide those services, mostly in uh, community-based freestanding agencies and about 40 of them are hospital-based. What we can offer to the caucus is that we facilitate a variety of practice groups, which are basically committees, um, and each one focuses on a particular sector of behavioral health care. 
for example, we have a children's group, an adult mental health group, an addictions group, and all of them also discuss IDD because there is a prevalence of co-occurring disorders, either uh, two or all three of those. And we advocate, although our mission's uh, the official wording is that we promote our providers as the uh, the best behavioral health care providers. Our goal is uh, also directly associated with the individuals who need those services that our members provide. So for example, our current advocacy campaign, uh, Diverse Faces, Many Lives, Individuals uh, Rely on Behavioral Health Services to Thrive, is from the perspective of individuals receiving services. We're demonstrating the impact of those services and tying it into our, our budgetary requests and our advocacy policies to help garner more support from the legislature and the um, governor and also federal legislators and other policymakers. Through those practice groups that I mentioned, we gain a wealth of input from providers, their firsthand experience in working with individuals with these various disorders, as well as co-occurring physical health conditions, the impact that they are experiencing or that they anticipate with regulations and legislation, it informs our advocacy. And we do work with legislators in helping to develop or to uh, create amendments to legislation. So we have a, a wealth of resources to provide insight that can help develop legislation that would be maximally supportive uh, for the providers and the inv individuals that they are committed to serving. Thank you. Good afternoon, Tom Brady, Director of Advocacy and Public Affairs for the Brain Injury Alliance of New Jersey. Uh, it's good to be with you today. The Alliance has been in existence since 1981, and our mission is to improve the quality of life for anyone impacted by brain injury. And broadly speaking, we do this, we do this by uh, support, advocacy, information, and promoting brain injury uh, prevention. And we envision a world where all people with brain injury and their caregivers maximize their quality of life and minimize the consequences of brain injury because unfortunately a lot of people are subject to that and we try and make life as optimal as we can for them. Uh, of particular note, I um, want to point out that we have a helpline. I think for the benefit of the elected officials and or their staff, if you come in contact with um, a person with brain injury, one of your constituents, I think a good first line of um, input to our organization is to our helpline. And you can call us at 732-745-0200. Obviously, that's a main takeaway from this pre-presentation. But we do other stuff as well. We do presentations. Last year, we did over 124, 125 virtual presentations, excuse me. We did introduction to brain injury, adjustment to brain injury. We focused on concussion in senior seniors, um, bike safety, driver safety, whole host of things. We also do a Cares for Kids program where we serve families and we serve them based on individual needs of that particular family. And more importantly, the person impacted by brain injury. We also do, we also, <clears throat> pardon me, we also do support groups throughout the entire state. We have support groups in 17 of the 21 counties here in New Jersey. And basically people get together to, to share their experience with brain injury and in hopes of helping one another out. We do educational events. We're working on our annual seminar, which typically occurs in May of each year. We also do a fall family conference in usually in June, ever since we've had um, the COVID-19 pandemic, we've been doing these things virtual. And um, most recently, we did a seminar offered on, on uh, pediatric, pediatrics and brain injury, excuse me. So moving forward, my particular role is advocacy and public affairs, namely public policy. Some of you I've worked with over the years on certain public policy issues, and look forward to doing that again, and working on any issues that you come across in your respective districts that we can um, be a resource um, for. Thank you. 
Hello, my name is Rose Greenblatt and I am an occupational therapist as well as co-chair of the New Jersey Disability Action Committee. We are a group of grassroots advocates that formed during May 2020 in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And we now continue our work in an effort to maintain the unity and intersectionality across the disability silos present in our community. We focus on advocacy and policy change. This started with a report that came out in October of 2020, and we continue that work by advocating to legislators actively at this time. Our goal is to empower people with disabilities through advocacy in a way that allows them to meaningfully utilize the mechanisms of change that surround them. We help them bring concerns to relevant agencies, such as legislators, the governor's front office, and relevant agencies, such as the Department of Health. We do this by having meetings, running letter campaigns, and writing targeted letters on our letterhead. At this time, we are actively building our capacity while advocating for certain measures, such as A1487, and S286, which focuses on induction looping for the deaf and hard of hearing community, as well as A1701 and S285, which focuses on emergency management preparedness for the disability community. If you have anyone in your constituencies who could benefit from being connected to a larger disability community and getting their hand in advocacy, we would love to hear from them. I will leave my email in the chat and we hope to hear from you soon. Millie, are you there? Millie Gonzalez? Yes, this is me. This is Millie, I'm here. Thanks, Millie. If you could also pin Colleen, that would be great. My name is Millie Gonzalez. I am the co-founder of the New Jersey Disability Collective. My pronouns are she, her, and ella. I am a disabled Hispanic plus size female wearing a gray and black shirt, yellow jewelry, curly dark hair. My Zoom background is black with the New Jersey Disability Collective logo. And I'm here with my colleague, co-founder, Colleen Roach. Thanks, Millie. My, my pronouns are she, her. I am a white disabled female with long, light brown hair. The New Jersey Disability Collective is a group of advocates with disabilities who amplify one another's work and share space to connect, energize, and revitalize our community. NJDC prioritizes emergent community-wide cross-disability issues and creates system change that supports choice and equity for all people with disabilities. Founded in March 2020 in response to the immediate and disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on the disability community, NJDC is an advocacy group run by and for New Jerseyans with disabilities. Our members are known disabled advocates in their communities who were already mobilized to address the pandemic and other issues affecting people with disabilities, many of which gained more widespread attention since the pandemic began. Over the last two years, we have created a place where disabled advocates have joined forces to affect policy and social change with the goal of inclusion, equality, and collective freedom. This has been achieved through communicating with our legislators in various ways, as, as well as collaborating with others doing social justice work. We also acknowledge and honor the experience of what it means to live in a world that is more disabling than our disabilities and work to remove the barriers that prevent disabled people from showing up as their whole authentic selves in advocacy and everywhere. Because as we know, all issues are disability issues. In addition to working on systems change, we identify and address the individual concerns of our members, not only in times of crisis, but also in dealing with longstanding barriers to accept accessing critical supports and services. NJDC also takes time to celebrate one another's successes in all areas of life and ensures that there is time and space to rejuvenate before we tackle the next issue. Lastly, and perhaps most uniquely, NJDC recognizes the humanity in advocacy work 
That is, we know none of us can do this work alone and understand the importance of peer support and of holding each other accountable for practicing self-care. This work is collaborative and we appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Thank you. Hi, my name is Diane Riley. I'm executive director of the Supportive Housing Association of New Jersey. I'm delighted to be here amongst such esteemed colleagues who I work with every day, doing such important work for the people of the state who are challenged by barriers and disabilities. <clears throat> the Supportive Housing Association of New Jersey is a statewide network of organizations committed to advancing and increasing the availability of supportive housing, that is safe, affordable, accessible housing for people with special needs and the services that they need to thrive and be independent and to be uh, living and, and working in the communities of their choice throughout the state. That's a pretty big handful. We do this through our membership. Our membership are developers who create the affordable housing, our service providers who provide the important services and employees that help people live in the community. And that is a variety of disabilities. We span disabilities, so intellectual and developmental disabilities, people struggling with mental health and addiction, veterans, seniors, people uh, coming out of the homeless system, uh, all of these people. And that is a pretty tall order. I think what we do best is because we work with all of those stakeholders we can span the silos that often exist in the government, and you know what I'm talking about in terms of the Department of Community Affairs, Department of Human Services, all the divisions underneath. We can tell you what people need and how those things are interconnected so you can build the better policies you need to help the, to help the people who live in New Jersey. I think we're missing a huge part of the population that can live more integrated, and can live the, a most, the most robust life they can. And we're here to, and committed to helping you do that. We do it through education, we through, do it through advocacy, and we do it through connecting partners. I wanna thank the council because they've given us a number of, of grants to provide resources for people. They've created this legislative caucus, which is an amazing feat. And they have helped us advocate for things like the Special Needs Housing Trust Fund and thanks to our legislators. I will put information in the chat and I hope to hear from you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tom Bafuto, the Executive Director of the ARC of New Jersey. I'm delighted to be with everyone this afternoon. The ARC of New Jersey is a statewide advocacy organization for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities and their families. We have 20 chapters of the ARC that provide services in all 21 counties of the state. The chapters are where a person with intellectual and developmental disabilities receives the hands-on support. Chapters offer everything from day programs, group homes, supported employment, and respite. On the state level, we advocate on behalf of people with IDD in all stages of life to ensure they are receiving the appropriate supports and services to live a full and integrated life in the community. We focus our advocacy on legislation that will impact people with IDD, their families, and the local county chapters. This includes issues ranging from accessibility, employment, transportation, direct support professional wages, housing, among other things. We also spend a significant amount of time advocating on the state budget each year to ensure proper funding is appropriated to support people with IDD, specifically within the departments of human services, health, labor, and children and families. The ARC of New Jersey is happy to serve as a resource to legislators when it comes to policy, whether it's determining where new legislation is needed, reviewing bills and providing feedback, or arranging site visits to meet individuals with disabilities and their families and hear firsthand where the needs are. We also encourage legislators to make our information available to your district office staff, specific, specifically your constituent services person. Through the Arkham New Jersey's Family Institute, we're happy to help any of your constituents who contact your office and who are looking for resources or assistance navigating the service delivery system. Additionally, within the ARC of New Jersey, 
We run a planning for adult life program that assists students transitioning out of their educational entitlements. Project Hire, a program that connects people with intellectual and development disabilities to integrated employment opportunities in the community. The self-advocacy program that teaches individuals with IDD how to advocate for their own needs as well as other people with disabilities and a criminal justice advocacy program that provides alternatives to incarceration on behalf of individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. I thank you for this opportunity to tell you about the ARC of New Jersey, and we're delighted to be a supporting agency of the New Jersey Legislative Caucus. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Um, I'm Valerie Sellers. I'm the CEO, <clears throat> excuse me, of the New Jersey Association of Community Providers. Uh, NJACP represents approximately 65 agencies from the most northern part of the state of New Jersey to the most southern part. It is a diverse group of providers offering a full array of services. Uh, the, the mission of NJACP is to advance sustainable community-based services and supports to the IDD community. Uh, NJACP was established almost 40 years ago uh, and has grown over the years and focuses not only on state issues, but also on national issues. Uh, like uh, the ARC of New Jersey, and you'll hear from ABCD, we are an advocacy organization. Uh, that advocacy is not just focused on providers, it's focused on ensuring that we create a community where people can leave, uh, lead rich and fulfilling lives. Um, I would also share with you that we offer a number of other services. We provide education and training. Uh, we bring strategic partners to our members who offer services and products that will benefit them uh, in, in meeting their mission and serving their communities. Uh, we periodically engage in research and special initiatives. The one initiative that I just wanted to raise, and I'll do it very briefly, is the Governor Murphy signed into law legislation to address the issues of recruitment and retention of direct support professional. And this legislation is linked to the New Jersey Community College Consortium for Workforce and Economic Development. And JACP first developed this legislation three years ago and three years later, we saw it signed into law. It will allow uh, agencies and organizations to work with potential prospective DSPs in the community, be it high school, um, unemployed, underemployed, <clears throat> and those that are already attending community college may participate in this program. Uh, the other is we're gonna provide support to existing DSPs. Essentially, it creates a center where a DSP can call and find out what is available to them. And through BOGS and DDD, uh, they have formed a task force to look at the credentialing issues. And through NJCP's partnership with the Council of Community Colleges and the Consortium for Workforce and Economic Development, we will have a career counselor that will be the point person for any DSP in the state. And um, we believe that if we can enhance and improve our, our DSP workforce, that it only serves to benefit the IDD community. Um, thank you for letting us be a part of this uh, legislative caucus as well. Hi, everybody. My name is Kathy Chin. I'm the executive director of the Alliance for the Betterment of Citizens with Disabilities. I want to thank you all because I found, I found this very, very inspiring at one of the darkest times we've had to face in years. So thank you so much for all that you do. Um, as I said, I'm the executive director of ABCD, which was founded in 1995 when New Jersey served more people with developmental disabilities in state institutions than almost any other state in the nation. ABCD represents community providers across the state who serve children and adults in the community at every stage of life and at every level of ability, including people with multiple physical, neurological, and developmental disabilities. ABCD members included early intervention services, day program providers, residential and support coordination agencies, working to prepare individuals to be successful, independent and included, and to ensure that the planning, 
infrastructure and funding are in place for them to realize their goals. Um, congratulations to the caucus, amazing work this past year, and thanks to Mercedes for her leadership. And we look forward to continuing the process. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, that was certainly a, what I'll call a speed dating round. Um, and you all really brought your remarks um, in as close to the, the two minute mark as you could, but um, just know this session is recorded. Um, it's available and it will be available um, soon on our uh, the dedicated webpage for the caucus. And we'll also be providing a directory um, so that anyone who needs to contact any of the supporting organizations can locate each other. And hopefully members of the legislature and your staff will use that directory frequently. Um, if you are not a supporting organization, but you're on this call today, you can also become a supporting organization by going to that webpage. So thank you for joining us. We're really eager to continue planning the remainder of the three sessions this year, April 26th, July 26th, and October 25th. Um, the fourth Tuesday of every month for, of those months from noon to 1 p.m. We're anxious to welcome new members of the Legislative Caucus and eager for new leadership of the caucus um, in the next, uh, in the coming weeks. So you are all our champions. Thank you for all you do and continue to do um, so that people with disabilities get to live their best life. Um, thank you very much. Have a great rest of your day.